What are your expectations for the next hour? It's evening time. Some people find evening as the perfect time to meditate. Other times, other people find that it's a hard time. Your energy level is down. And you start telling yourself, well, it's not going to be good tonight. You've got to watch out for that. You've got to allow yourself to think outside the box. Don't box yourself in. Each meditation should be an exploration. What's the breath going to be like tonight? What's the shape of my mind going to be like tonight? What is it like right now? Take stock of it. Get a sense of where it's out of balance. And remember that you have a whole range of tools to use. You could stay with the breath. Or before you settle down with the breath, you might try something else. Try goodwill for all beings. You can either start with goodwill for yourself and work out, or start with goodwill outside and then work back in. Contemplate the bones in the body. Start with the tips of the fingers, the bones in the first joints. Where are they right now, all ten of them? Do you feel any tension around them? Relax the tension. Then go to the second joints, and then the third. The bones of the palms, or you can view them as the bones of the back of the hand. Whichever side seems to hold more tension, relax the tension there. Work up through the wrist and up through the arms. When you hit the shoulders, then you start down at the toes and come up through the legs, the spine, the skull. There are lots of different topics you could focus on right now. As the Buddha said, there are times when you try to settle down with a body sitting right here, and there's a fever. It could be a fever in the mind, a fever in the body. Not so much a physical fever, just an antsiness. Okay, what's the problem? What can you do to soothe the fever? He says, find a topic that you find inspiring. Think about that. And then eventually the mind will be able to settle down again and be ready to be with the breath. In other words, don't just give in to your preconceived notions. We live our lives so hemmed in. It's good to think about the Buddha having broken out. He had lots of expectations placed on him. He didn't meet his family's expectations at all. In the Pali Canon, they don't tell many details about his going forth. The dramatic stories come in the later versions, but in the Pali Canon it's dramatic enough. He said he cut off his hair while his parents were crying and left the house. He made a clean break. And throughout the history of Buddhism, the people who really go for the Dharma make a clean break. There's that story of Ajahn Singh, who was one of Ajahn Mun's first students. He'd been a Pali student, and so after he studied with Ajahn Mun for a while, went back to see his teacher, tried to get the teacher to go see Ajahn Mun as well. The teacher ended up throwing his spittoon at him. Ajahn Singh was pretty plain spoken, but he didn't let that deter him. Maybe, well, if I can't get anywhere else to go practice with the John Munn, I'll go back and practice some more myself. And for all the teachers in the all the Johns in the forest tradition, you think about what was expected of them. Sons of peasants, they're expected just to stay there and till the land, and be poor. And looking at them from the outside, you wouldn't expect that they wouldn't be able to attain the normal attainments. But they didn't let 
outside expectations keep them down. And they didn't internalize those outside expectations. And John Munn would have to fight against some of those outside expectations. When he was teaching them, he said, look, you have everything that's needed. These people were told that they just didn't have them have it in them to get ahead in life. He said, you have it within you, all you need to gain the noble attainments. You've got a body sitting here. You've got a mind that's mindful and alert. may not be perfectly mindful, and may not be perfectly alert, but you've got the, the seeds of those qualities. And you realize that you're suffering, and you're looking for a way out. That's enough. And it's interesting, you look at the Ajans. They have an interesting combination of strong faith in the Buddha and very curious, inquisitive minds. They didn't go for a meditation technique that simply programmed them. They question things, and the John Mun encouraged them to question things. This, of course, is in line with the Buddhist teachings on questioning the text, questioning your teacher. Just because the teacher says something, it's not necessarily true. Just because the text says something, it's not necessarily true. I remember when John Sowat came out of his coma, he mentioned he'd had a dream where the Buddha was meeting with a lot of arahants, and they were going over the Pali Canon, determining which, which parts were authentic and which ones are not. And when he told this to people, nobody batted an eye. It was not considered outrageous to question the canon. And you find the teachers coming with original teachings on, say, the three characteristics. And John Cha would note that you know, in constant things do have their constant side. They all fall constantly under the, the pattern of dependent core rising. They constantly fall under the truths of the Four Noble Truths. So that side is constant to them. And John Lee had his own way, in fact, two different ways of dealing with the three characteristics. One is he noticed that certain aspects of your body stay the same. Your mouth has never turned into your eye. Your hands have never turned into your feet. There are certain things that are constant, but that doesn't mean they should be clung to. He goes on to point out, you're practicing concentration. You're taking these inconstant aggregates, perception, fabrication, feeling, body, consciousness, and you're trying to make them as constant as possible. You see that they do have their constant side. These things that are stressful do have their pleasant side. You can create a sense of ease and, con and concentration, strong well-being. Out of what? Out of these five aggregates. And you can exert some control over them. That's the primary characteristic of self. The Buddha points this out in his first sermon. It's because we don't have total control over these things that we can't really say that are, they're ours. But we do have some control. So you see that the Forest of Johns were questioning things, and they were encouraged to question. In fact, as John Mahabha once said, I tried to prove the Buddha wrong. So they thought for themselves. But then, as John Lee pointed out, when you find things that are constant and easeful and under your control, you realize that they too should be abandoned. Otherwise, you're holding yourself back. So they had strong faith in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. And a lot of this comes from their experience out in the woods. You're out there alone, with no protection. The only thing between you and the wilderness when you're sitting in meditation is your mosquito net. That's not much. So where is your protection? Your confidence that you're doing something good. Your confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And you find that you put that to the test again and, and again and again, and you get more and more genuine sense of refuge in these things.
But at the same time, you're allowed to be inquisitive. The Buddha himself encouraged it. The Ajahns encouraged it. So the meditation is not an indoctrination. You're not told that if you see that there is no self, then you've came to awakening. I mean, anybody can force themselves to contemplate things until they decide, yes, there is no self, because they believe there's a reward that comes. But as John said, you're not here for anybody else's reward, anybody else's certification. You're here because you're suffering, you want to put an end to suffering, so you're inquisitive. If you're not inquisitive, you simply say, okay, I'll apply these perceptions to whatever comes up, and constantly stress, not self. How do you know that you're not indoctrinating yourself? You incline the mind to see things in that way. Does that mean they truly are that way? It's only when you flip things around that you can test them and see to what extent these things are true, to what extent they're not. The Buddha himself treated the three perceptions as teachings that are true but not always beneficial. There's that story about the monk who, hearing the Buddha say that all the aggregates are not self, and he asks, well, if the aggregates are not self, then what self is going to be affected by the things that are done by not self? You can see where his thinking is leading. There's nobody there to be responsible for the actions. There's nobody going to be affected by the actions. So you can do what you want. The Buddha called him out on this. He's thinking he could slip past his, the genuine use of these teachings, which was to help you let go of your clinging. There was another case when a junior monk was asked, what is the result of action? He said, well, the result of action is pain, which is very much the Naganta teaching at that time. He was asked by a wanderer, and the wanderer said, I've never heard any Buddhist monk say anything like this. You better go back and check it with the Buddha. So he goes to see Venerable Ananda. Ananda takes him to see the Buddha. And the Buddha basically says, when you're asked about action, that's not the time to be talking about the inconstancy of all feelings, the stress of all, all feelings. That's the time to talk about how some feelings are pleasurable, some are neutral, some are painful. Because the purpose of the teaching at that point, when you're talking about karma, is trying to induce people to do skillful things. If you say, well, everything you do is going to lead to pain, why bother trying to be skillful? So these perceptions are not always useful. And it's through trial and error that you figure out where they're best used, how they're used, to what extent they're true. And as John Lee points out, ultimately everything has to get put aside. That's his interpretation of the phrase, Sabe Dhammanata. All dhammas are not self. He said, even your right views you have to put aside at some point. So these are people who have thought outside the box. It's not that we're practicing here to attain right view, which is something that a lot of scholars will say. Right view is not the end, it's a means. It's part of that raft that you have to let go of. And in the meantime, you test it. It's in the testing that you develop your own sensitivity, and so in your own sensitivity that you see where you're causing yourself stress and suffering and how you can stop. You notice when the Buddha taught the Wings to Awakening, which he said were the teachings that everybody should agree on, they're almost all qualities of the mind. Otherwise, he didn't say you have to have this belief about this or this belief about that. The belief was about the Buddha's awakening, which comes down to belief in the power of your actions. Then everything else is qualities of mind that you need to bring to your actions. It includes having an inquisitive mind. You want to be honest and observant. So you develop those two qualities in spades. And to do that, you can't allow yourself to be hemmed in by your preconceived notions. You 
have to be willing to question things. So whatever limitations there are on your practice tonight, make sure you're not the one putting them there. You can use your imagination to help you. Imagine this is going to be a good session. And they say, well, the imagination on its own is not going to do it, but at least it opens up the possibility and reminds you that things may turn out differently than you might expect. So imagine them turning out well. And then from that, do what you can to make them turn out well. Share some ingenuity in your meditation. We're not just putting the mind through the, the meat grinder here. We're here to explore. See what you can find. <laughs>